did ping and it went off and you got no, this member and you're decapitated. It's probably because you're trying to hide something and make sure certain details don't come out. Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Annie Elise and this is my channel, 10 to Life. If you are brand new here, stopping by for the first time, welcome, I am happy to have you here. And if you are a returning subscriber, thanks for coming back. I've missed you and I'm happy to have you. I think I need to like ditch this jacket because we all know I talk with my hands and it's just, it feels like it's gonna be a problem. Hold on. Okay. All right, that's so much better. Oh God, okay, crazy hair. Anyways, the case we're going to be talking about today is really a tale of high school sweethearts and love gone wrong. And what really was happening behind the curtain of this picture perfect couple. It's a Romeo and Juliet story of teenage romance ending in tragedy. 16 year old Emma Walker was an honor student and cheerleader on her championship winning high school squad. <laughs> She dated Riley Gall, a wide receiver on the Maryville College football team in Tennessee. But days after she ended their two-year relationship, she was found shot to death in bed. Before we get started, don't forget to hit that subscribe button below, turn your notification bell to on so that you get notified of live streams and new videos as they get posted, and please give this video a thumbs up and comment with your theories and your opinions on this case below. I love getting this dialogue going with you guys in the comments, so make sure after you're done watching this case you leave your opinions below. Okay, so let's get right into it. At Central High School in Knoxville, Tennessee, a Friday night in the fall means a jam-packed football stadium, two teams battling it out on the football field, and a huge, huge stadium full of fans. I mean, think Friday Night Lights meets, I don't know, who else in the country likes football like as much as Friday Night Lights in Texas? I don't know. But imagine that. I mean, the crowd is out. Everybody's going wild. This crowd particularly is decked out in red and black, supporting their local Bobcats, and they are here for high school football. And of course, we know that no football game or football team is complete without their cheerleading squad. So out in front of the crowd, you have the high energy cheerleaders getting the crowd going and keeping the energy high. And in the fall of 2014, there was a new face on that squad. And this is the face of then 14 year old Emma Walker. Emma was brand new to this high school environment. She was 14 years old, on the cheerleading squad, a freshman, and described as very fun-loving, super kind, and just a teenager who enjoyed animals, wanted to become a vet one day, and was just all around a lovely girl. Emma's parents are Mark and Jill, and she also had a brother named Evan. Early that fall of 2014, Emma's energy and bright smile caught the eye of an older student, wide receiver Riley Gall. And how many times have we seen the cheerleader and the football player? It's like, I mean, do you even have a high school romance that isn't a cheerleader and a football player? I don't think so. And Riley was equally a fun-loving guy. He enjoyed video games. He wasn't the jock that everybody thought he was made out to be, but he was just a fun-loving guy just like Emma. Seemed like a match made in heaven. Emma and Riley's love story quickly took off. They began dating when she was a freshman, 14 years old, and and Riley was a junior, 16 years old. Their relationship was absolutely booming. I mean, they would hang out after the football games, on the weekends, they would go out with friends, and soon Emma's social media accounts were filled with pictures of this seemingly perfect pair, out paddle boarding, spending time with friends, embracing each other, taking silly selfies. I mean, truly just young love. Emma's parents also really liked Riley. They said he was a very kind guy, that he was very well-mannered, and although they were supportive of their new relationship, they kept a close eye on it in the beginning because as you do with any young relationship, you don't wanna just kind of turn a blind eye, you wanna keep close watch. So they did that, but all seemed normal and all seemed okay. However, friends say that they quickly grew concerned with the relationship. And they say that it became apparent that Riley didn't want Emma hanging out with anybody else. One friend even said he became controlling over her, what she did, her activities, and another friend added he got more possessive, more clingy towards her, and he wouldn't even allow her to do certain things. Now, this already, in my opinion, is a red flag because anytime there's any sort of possessive or obsessive behavior, that's pretty much indicative of a controlling relationship that usually ends disastrously. 
Over the next two years of dating, Riley and Emma transitioned from this once picture-perfect couple that everybody in their high school aspired to be to the other classic high school couple, the one that was always breaking up and getting back together, the one that was always fighting, and it really became a quite visibly toxic relationship. Friends described very dramatic arguments between the two of them, often over text message or Snapchat, and apparently Riley would always comment on what Emma wore, telling her that she should or shouldn't wear certain things. Ugh! Also, a huge red flag. Huge red flag. It apparently got so bad and it got to the point where Jill, Emma's mother, had to step in and basically say something to Emma about it because she was growing so concerned. In addition to all of this controlling and possessive behavior, Riley would stand out front of the grocery store that Emma worked at for hours, just lingering while she was inside working, as though he wanted to account for every move and every moment of her time. I mean, super scary stuff for a high school boy to already be possessing this type of controlling behavior. You've just got so many red flags now. You've got obsessiveness, possessiveness, control, it's just not good, and it's all of the ingredients that we know end up becoming a recipe for disaster, and oftentimes tragedy. Emma's parents also began to notice that things were very off. Riley had been going back to his ex-girlfriend and was essentially playing his ex-girlfriend and Emma at the same time. His parents began monitoring her texts and her Snapchat account and also didn't appreciate the tone and language that she would see Riley speaking to Emma in. In one of his texts to Emma that her parents saw, he said, I'll see your name in the obituary. Okay, so now this behavior is escalating from possessiveness, control, to danger and to abusive words, emotional abuse, because now he's threatening her and saying, I'll see your name in the obituary. It appears to just be getting worse and worse and escalating as this relationship continues. Emma's parents ultimately decided that they needed to ban Riley from their home, and they took away Emma's cell phone as well. They tried to stop the two from seeing each other, stopped the two from communicating, but unfortunately it didn't work. Riley ended up giving Emma an iPod Touch so she would text him then through Wi-Fi because it wasn't through her secure device that her parents had taken from her. And in true narcissistic, manipulative behavior, and in true fashion of these characteristics and these type of people, for every nasty message that Riley would send Emma, there was a quick apology. So he would say, Emma, I'm sorry for however I act in one message, and then in the other message, talk about what a B-I-T-C-H she is and how much he hated her. But then he would follow that up by saying, I love you more than words can describe. Cl just so many crazy head games and playing on Emma's emotions and manipulating the entire situation and gaslighting her, to be quite honest. As all of this was happening, Jill, Emma's mother, was desperately trying to convince Emma to stop seeing Riley. But she says, as you do with a teenager, the more you butt heads, the more she's going to think that she's in the right. And because he had a way of isolating Emma and making her think that he was the only one for her, she didn't want to continue to try to pull Emma away and isolate her even further. And I can draw on my own experience a little bit in that regard. When I was much younger, and I'm sure that if you're a woman and you're watching this, whether you have children or you relate to yourself when you were younger and in high school, you do think you're right. You think that if you're butting heads with your parent or if they are putting rules or regulations on you, it's because they're trying to hurt you somehow or they're trying to harbor you from having a good time or having fun. So I understand where this thought process came into play for her mother, Jill, because you don't want to try to control the situation so much that you end up pushing her further away and further into the enemy's arms. By fall 2016, which is now two years after they initially met, Emma and Riley were still dating. Riley had graduated at this point and he was an 18-year-old freshman at a nearby college. Emma was in her junior year of high school and their tumultuous relationship had not only continued, but it had gotten worse despite all of the attempts from her parents to intervene and stop it. Around Halloween that year, Emma's parents decided to ground her, not allowing her to leave the house except to go to school and to go to cheerleading. They also started monitoring everywhere that she went, and to their surprise, it seemed to work. Luckily, Emma finally ended the relationship with Riley for good, and according to her closest friends, she was ready to move on, and she was putting the past behind her. 
I'm sure that in addition to the rules and regulations that were imposed on her by her mother, I would imagine that a big factor of this was also Riley now being away at college. She was able to gain a little bit of distance, perhaps even some clarity in the situation. So finally, she said to her friends, you know what? I'm done. I'm done with this. I'm moving on. Boy, bye. Riley, however, did not seem to take the breakup very well. And while in his college dorm, he swallowed a bunch of Vicodin pills and washed them down with alcohol in an attempt to commit suicide. On Friday, November 18th, Emma was at a friend's house celebrating the football win. She started receiving weird texts, though, from an unknown sender. These texts were stating that the person on the other end had kidnapped somebody that she loved and that Emma needed to go outside alone to her car with her keys and that if she didn't comply, the person she loved that was kidnapped was going to be hurt. I mean, this feels like it's right out of a movie. She was also told that the person that had been kidnapped was in a ditch. So, so Emma went outside as instructed and she saw Riley lying there on the ground, appeared to have been kidnapped or recovering from a kidnapping and injured. He was acting as though he had been hit on the head, yet he was refusing to call the police which is a red flag. And so Emma told him, leave me alone. And she walked away. So was this a weird attempt of Riley's to like sad fish or like guilt fish? What's happening here? He's trying to manipulate the situation once again to get either in Emma's good graces or get her sympathy vote. It's just very bizarre. And if you, if you think this is weird, just wait because it escalates one step further. The very next day, on November 19th, Emma was home alone when someone was dressed in all black with a face cover, walked to her front door of her house, and rang the doorbell. Emma texted her friends, scared, but also in that moment, chose to text Riley. And she texted him that she hated him, but that she needed him right now because she was scared. Riley said he was speeding, and he was on his way over, and that he would be there in a moment. So Riley comes over, and when Jill got home, Emma and Riley were sitting in the front yard. Jill asked Riley to leave and mentioned to Emma that she thought it was very strange that these two back-to-back -back incidents both somehow involved Riley. Emma disagreed and said, no, it's just a coincidence. Riley was here to help me. But Jill, Emma's mother, felt like the whole thing was off, which absolutely it was off because was Riley involved in both of these things? When he realized that Emma didn't fall or care that he was kidnapped, did he say, hey, you know what? I'm going to escalate this and now start instilling fear in her. Maybe that will work. If she's not fearful for me and my safety, maybe I will cause her to be fearful of her own safety. Also, I can't help but wonder, is there some sort of level of high school dramatics here that was also intriguing for either of the parties of, oh, it feels like it's out of a movie. It's dangerous. I need you. Let me cling to you. It's just icky. The entire thing is very, very icky. So now it's Sunday. The weekend has pretty much come and gone and things seem to be normal. Emma's parents followed her to and from work to make sure that she was safe, but Everything seemed to have calmed down. Emma was texting with another friend about a school assignment. There wasn't anything out of the ordinary, and everything seemed okay overall. However, the next day on Monday, November 21st at 6 a.m., everything was about to change, and Emma's parents' life would be shattered forever. At 6 a.m., Jill went in Emma's bedroom to wake her up, and she received no response. She said Emma's name. She tapped her leg. Nothing. Absolutely no response from Emma. Then she decided to, of course, look at Emma's face and check for a pulse. Jill immediately called 911. Police arrived and determined that Emma had been shot. There were two bullets. One was lodged in the back of her ear and the other didn't hit her, but it was lodged in her pillow on her bed. Now, the night before, Mark, Emma's father, had said he heard something that sounded like slamming doors. He checked the house and everything seemed okay. Nothing was amiss. So nobody thought that it, they needed to call the police or that anything was, of course, a possible danger. However, now, given the circumstances, they, of course, are feeling otherwise. Emma's death devastated the community, and it devastated Riley. He posted multiple tributes on social media to Emma. I love you, Emma. I can't be around any of that yet. It's too soon. I know you know I'm dying to be there, but understand I can't. I love you. That's my beautiful Emma. Rest easy now, sweetheart. Putting in a Bible verse. Be sure to remind God about our verse. I love you forever and always. 
Here you can see he also posted in his notepad a very long message to Emma. You're gone, but I promise your legacy will live on through each day and every person who loves and cares about you. And that number of people is endless. You're beautiful. You're amazing. You're funny, compassionate, caring. You're my best friend. There's not a human on earth that can make the impact that you've had on my life. I will miss you more than anything. You'll weigh heavy on my mind for the rest of my life because no one can fill the void that's in my heart right now. It feels like just a couple weeks ago we were messing with each other at the game and smiling and enjoying the comfort and warmth of each other. Just knowing you have someone that's so in love with you, gives so much hope to your life ahead, and it can be taken away just like that. Everyone knows how great you were, how exceptional of a person you were, and not a single person that you've affected will ever forget you. I mean, these messages are crazy. Be. And we see a lot of this mirror exactly what happened in the recent Alexa Sharkey case. And if you're not familiar with that case, I have the playlist, go watch it. But her husband did the exact same thing after she was found. He posted tons to social media talking about how this is so awful for him, how his heart is breaking, making it about himself, and also trying to have this public display of how much he loves Alexis, just as Riley is trying to portray this public display of how much he loves Emma and needs Emma and how they were soulmates, even though they were broken up and had a pattern of a very toxic relationship. As the police began their investigation and detectives were looking into certain things, Riley's name kept coming up in the investigation. A friend of Riley's named Alex McCarthy told detectives that he had gone to Riley's house in order to check up on him because he said Riley was, of course, very distraught, very heartbroken over the passing of Emma. Alex told detectives that while he was at Riley's house, Riley showed him a gun that he had stolen from his grandfather. And Riley had said that the reason he stole the gun was for his protection. He said he was scared for his own safety after that alleged kidnapping and also the safety of Emma and that that's why he stole the gun. And this information did not sit well with Alex. Alex told investigators that Riley made it clear he wasn't suicidal, but continued to explain this story that Riley had said as far as worried about his own safety and he needed this gun for his protection and for Emma's protection. Another friend of Riley's named Noah Walton told detectives that Riley had asked him how to get fingerprints off of a gun. Another alarming piece of information. And when Riley was asking Noah, hey, how do you get fingerprints off a gun? He said the reason why he was asking is because he was scared he was going to get pinned for something he didn't do. Okay, no reason that somebody's going to dust for fingerprints and you're going to get pinned for something you didn't do if your fingerprints were not on a gun that fired the bullets that were in Emma's house and in her head and ultimately killed her. You're blowing your cover, Riley. You're not very smart, in my opinion. So that's when Alex and Noah knew that they needed to take this information to the police and help the detectives with the investigation because there were all sorts of red flags going up. When detectives questioned Riley about everything, he was very, very vague. He not only denied having the gun, but he also only referred to Emma as that girl during the entire interview. Now, that's very odd because it's clearly a sign of disassociation, which just before this, he was all over social media with these tributes to Emma, saying the love of my life, calling her by name. That night, he posted this on social media, living every day through Emma. I love you, beautiful, and I know you're in a better place now. My beautiful Emma, rest easy now, sweetheart. Right. But now all of the sudden that he's being questioned in a legal setting and in legal capacity with these detectives, he's completely disassociating and only referring to her as that girl, not wanting to have any sort of ties or emotional ties to Emma. Everything blew up pretty quickly in all of this. And on Tuesday, November 22nd, both Riley's two friends that had grown super concerned about the behavior, Alex and Noah, were wired up with microphones and a transmitter and also a hidden video camera because they were going to do a sting operation for the police. The boys asked Riley to come over to the house and play video games with them. While there, Riley asked them to tell the investigators that they were on LSD and that whatever statements they had previously given to police were not straightforward. They don't have anything because if they did, I would be in jail right now. He even claimed Emma took her own life. She killed herself because of me and Karen's. 
or she just put herself against her parents but she didn't kill herself she did riley then wanted to go to a place called the bluffs a wooded area near the tennessee river and he told his friends that the reason he wanted to go to this place by the river called the Bluffs was to get rid of the gun. So they stopped by Riley's grandpa's house on the way to the Bluffs to get the gun, and Riley comes out of the house with a trash bag in which he said he had put the gun in. Now in this moment, tensions are of course high because they're driving, they're involved in this sting operation, they have Riley in the back who they believe is guilty for Emma's murder, he just went inside, collected a gun, could he use this gun on them, could this situation turn into another disaster. I mean, the tension is at an all-time high, the nervous energy. I can't even imagine what the vibe in that car must have been like during this drive to the bluffs. Meanwhile, Alex and Noah were in a group text with the police, and they were also being followed by a sheriff in an unmarked SUV. When they arrived at the bluffs, Riley was being very meticulous and was also putting on white gloves. Now, I don't know if the only gloves he had accessible were white or if he thought that he needed the white gloves to clean so that he could see if he got anything off, but still weird. Alex ended up screaming, oh my God, that's a real gun. And Noah said the code word that they had already established with the detectives and within 90 seconds, police had surrounded their car and took Riley into custody. Again, I feel like that would have just been a very nervous, scary moment. I know I would have been nervous if I was doing a sting operation on my friends and they had a gun and they were had it out and they were cleaning. I mean, I would be super nervous. But luckily, the police came in and within 90 seconds, Riley was arrested and then taken into custody. Riley was charged with first degree murder and six other felony charges, including theft of a firearm and aggravated stalking, tampering with evidence and employing a firearm during a dangerous felony. A couple of months later on January 30th, 2017, Riley posted a million dollar bond and was released with a GPS monitor to his ankle. Two weeks later on February 13th, the trial was set to begin on August 1st, 2017, which was going to be that upcoming fall. There was a motion granted that allowed Riley to travel from his house to his attorney's office, but he couldn't have any other travel outside of that. And remember, he had the GPS ankle monitor on. The trial ended up being moved, and it didn't begin until the following spring, April 30th, 2018. Walter Stone, Riley's defense attorney, argued that Riley didn't want to kill Emma. He wanted to show her that he was coming to her rescue and being her hero. And in this apparent effort to play hero, Riley stole his grandfather's 9mm handgun, went to Emma's home, fired two shots into Emma's bedroom, and thought that if he could present a legitimate threat, he could swoop in, save Emma from the danger, and win her back. So... Because of this elaborate story that the defense attorney was spinning, he was arguing for a lesser charge, reckless endangerment. Trying to get off of first-degree murder and these other felony charges and take it down to reckless endangerment, to this story of, I was just trying to scare her and you know, bring her back into my arms, which very well could be true. Maybe he didn't intentionally go to her house to murder her that night. However... You shot and fired a gun into her bedroom window. You took the risk knowing that it may hit her. So you now have to take responsibility for what happened. And again, even if that was his apparent story to be her hero, how sick and twisted do you have to be to come up with that elaborate story trying to win your partner back? It is so bizarre to me. During the trial, Riley addressed the court and Emma's family, and he said, I'm sorry I took Emma away from you. My intentions were not and never have been to cause physical harm. I wanted to scare her. I loved Emma. There is not a day that goes by that I don't think about what I did. First and foremost, I would like to sincerely apologize to the Walker family for causing nothing but pain and turmoil for their entire family. My words may carry little to no value to you, but I found it imperative to let you know the truth. That I'm sorry I took Emma away from you. That I robbed you of the experience of being able to watch your daughter grow up. Again, I'm sorry. I would also like to apologize to my family for the pain and embarrassment I put you through. I love you, and I hope that you can forgive me. I know that nothing I can do will ever bring Emma back or alleviate the pain that I've caused. But what I can do is tell the truth of what happened that night. My intentions were not, and never have been, caused Emma any physical harm. At times, I was a terrible boyfriend. I caused her emotional and psychological pain during the two years that we were together. 
that I never once even imagined to cause her any physical harm. My intentions that night were never to harm Emma, let alone take her life. I wanted to scare her, to frighten her so bad that she would have no choice but to talk to me again, to confide in me. I would be there to comfort her and to win her back. I loved Emma, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about her or what I did. I know that I can't be forgiven, and that this will never be forgotten. But now that the truth is out, I pray that it's enough to show that I never meant to take in his life. Again, I'm sorry. I hope that that is true. I hope that he sits with it every single day and knows what how reckless his behavior was, how thoughtless his behavior was, and that he is sitting and reflecting on the damage that he has caused for this poor family and the horrific nightmare of it they had to endure because of him and because of his selfishness and possessiveness and obsessiveness. On May 8, 2018, after four hours of jury deliberation, Riley was found guilty of first-degree murder. He was found not guilty of aggravated stalking, but was found guilty of stalking, guilty of theft, guilty of tampering with evidence, guilty of reckless endangerment, not guilty of employing a firearm during a dangerous felony, but guilty of possession of a firearm during the commission of a dangerous felony, and guilty of felony murder. A lot of charges. Riley was then taken into custody. Riley was taken into custody on May 8th and sentenced to a life term for first-degree murder. He'll be eligible for parole after 51 years. He was also sentenced to a 29-day sentence for a misdemeanor stalking charge, one year for the felony theft charge, three years for the felony of tampering with evidence, three years for the felony reckless endangerment, and three for felony possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. And all of those charges run concurrently. So now what? Riley is in prison serving a life sentence, possibly eligible for parole. It's 2021 and Emma would be in her junior year of college right now. Just beginning her life with such a bright future ahead, but instead she was robbed of that by her jealous and possessive boyfriend. So now she is dead and he is in prison. For what? For what? For what purpose? To what end? We often see cases of DV turn deadly in marriages and more mature relationships, but this is a perfect illustration that DV and abusive relationships can truly happen at any age. And it's a reminder that if you see something, say something. And God forbid, if you personally find yourself in an abusive situation, please, please reach out for help. You can get out. You can get out. It's not easy, it takes a lot of courage, and more times than not, it takes more than one attempt, but you deserve more, and please believe that, because you can get out. Thank you guys for listening to today's case with me today, guys. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, turn that notification bell to on, and please, on your way out, give this video a thumbs up, and comment with your opinions below. You know I love hearing from you guys. Do you feel as though justice was served in this case, or do you feel as though Riley should not be eligible for parole? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks again for taking the time to listen with me today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the coverage. Until the next case, stay safe. Bye.